I used to joke I'd like to retire by 50. In reality, I probably will have to retire by 50, but it won't be my choice. But that's a good thing, huh? You can do lots of other things in your time. A lot of the young dentists, they know what they're doing. They have been taught everything. But have they been taught everything like we were in previous years? I don't think so. Does that make them better dentists? Not necessarily. Does it make them worse dentists? Not necessarily. Does it make them not as confident? Yes. You're probably going to get sued maybe once in your career. Mm. And when that letter lands on your doormat, you just simply hand it over yep. to the indemnity company. Don't worry about it. It happens. The minute I feel like I'm not doing it right anymore, I will have to step back from dentistry because that is the only ethical thing to do um, and the correct thing to do. There will be more dentists out there with this condition and they will be hiding it. They will not be telling people. And there is no need to be that person. Hi guys and welcome to another episode of Dentistry Unmasked. Today, I will be talking to the inspirational Shafak Ali. Shafak has early onset Parkinson's and please, I want you to listen to this story because it's inspirational. It's really affecting, um, you know, the way she can work. It's affecting her family life, obviously her career, as we've mentioned, but she still continues to do great things uh, to make, you know, the profession aware of Parkinson's disease. And, uh, you know, when you have that, uh, moment in, in, in your practicing career where you may not be able to practice anymore. Many of us are not aware of the options that we have available to us. So please listen to the first part of this podcast to, to really, um, you know, understand uh, what, what, what benefits we have as dentists to help protect us when, when times are tough. Shafak also does some uh, fantastic work with Mental Dental Facebook group and Confidential, uh, which is a phone line, not just for dentists, but for the whole dental profession. Um, and again, the uh, constant uh, theme of the podcast about stress and uh, dentists not being prepared uh, for work um, clinically and uh, psychologically as well uh, keeps keeps coming up again and again and again. So uh, my reflection on this podcast, which we re recorded a few weeks ago now, um, and, and, and listening to the first uh, three or four podcasts which have already been published, the same themes just keep coming up again and again and again about dentists not being prepared. Uh, but it's really, really interesting listening to this episode back uh, to, to, to hear about the, the, the topics that dentists will ring up uh, the phone line and, and, and want to talk about. So have a listen and big thank you to Shafak for coming to talk to us uh, here in Leeds at Dentistry and Mast and always a big thank you to our sponsors as well. Uh, I'd also like to just very quickly announce that, you know, uh, Dr. Edward Lee of ABC Smile Clinic in Marleybone in London is the winner of a Hedro Academy BOPT Burkitt. Uh, so Edward, thank you for liking, sharing and subscribing uh, to the podcast. Uh, Edward also um, left a little comment. So that's what you guys have to do. If you would like to win a Hedro Academy Burkitt worth £200, free of charge, kindly uh, donated by former dental supplies, all you have to do is just give this uh, podcast a like, a subscribe and a share. Leave a comment on uh, one of the platforms, whether it be YouTube, uh, Apple or Spotify, and uh, you are then in a draw to win a Burkitt. I hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you. Thank you for coming to uh, speak to us today. Um, we were just having a little catch up in the back. I think it's been nearly 19 years since since I last saw you. Uh, yeah, 20. 20. 20 years. 20 yeah, years. 20 years since Where I last Where does the time go? Exactly. Uh, but uh, we both graduated from GKT mm -hmm. uh, and we both find our way up here in, uh, in West Yorkshire. Yeah. So please fill me in what's happened to you. Over the last 20 years, what's your journey been? Oh my been gosh, to, what, what hasn't happened? From graduation to today? Um, well, everything that's happened to most people, I think. Um, I, I did VT in London. I met a nice fella. Um, he's from Manchester, mm -hmm. so I migrated. Um, I did tell him when we met that there was no point in us getting to know one another because I didn't think I'd be ever leaving London. And um, I was, yeah, taking those words back when a few years later, I forget moving to Manchester, I moved to Newcastle. So he's a surgeon. So he did his, um, you know, the surgical rotations yeah. and everything. So that was in West York. In, no, he started off in Yorkshire. He went to um, Manchester. He did his basic surgical rotation. And then he got a post in Sheffield. And then he got a post in Newcastle. 
So forget leaving um, M25 for for um, Manchester. I ended up in Newcastle for 10 years as well. Um, I worked in Northumberland in a beautiful farming town called Hexham. Really? You're in yeah, Hexham? Yeah, I've seen, yeah, you post things about Slaley Hall, don't you? What so. a small world, yeah, I love I've had my, We've had our Christmas dinners at Slaley Hall. Right, okay. So, um, so yeah, so... Um, yeah, I love Hexham. Anyway, I, lo- I I actually bawled my eyes up when I left Hexham. It was such a lovely practice. Um, I loved my patients. I, I actually really, I'm, I, lo- I love my job. I'm a real sucker for my job. I would, yeah, I enjoy it. Um, I have a real passion for it. And then from there, I moved to, when my husband got a consultant post, we moved to West Yorkshire. Wow. So, which is much better because I'm now near Manchester where his parents are and only three hours from London, which is much better than being in Newcastle, which is what a five and a half hour drive. So much better. So now we're here and I'm working in NHS practice now as well. Mm-hmm. Um, just in Barnsley, mm-hmm. exotic Barnsley. Um, nothing wrong with Barnsley. Nothing wrong with Barnsley, <laughs> where they call water water. Um, but I'll be teased for that now. Um, but anyway, yeah, no, it's lovely. I actually really, I, I'm really, really lucky. I had to, when I first moved to West Yorkshire, I had a few, um, a couple of four starts um, in practices I wasn't, as suited to or they to me or I to them um, before I landed up in Cuddeth and it was very soon actually I, we moved in February and I started in Cuddeth in August of 16 2016 mm-hmm. so um and yeah I've been there ever since been and I like since. it I've done my IV sedation training and I do a lot of IV sedation um and I work in part, part-time NHS mostly I do, you know, just do very, very rarely do the um, private dentistry. It's quite a big split in the practice. So um, they have the NHS dentists downstairs and the Demplan dentists upstairs. And it's the NHS dentists are so busy that they can't do the private work. So any private work that does come in, we just end up referring it upstairs anyway. Mm-hmm. But it's good. I don't mind. It's good for me. It works for me. And I really enjoy my, um, uh, now that I've got a nice stable patient base, I enjoy it. Great. Whistle stop 20 years. Amazing. Yep. So... <clears throat> Why did you head into dentistry in the first place? What was it? I mean, you're passionate about it and it's great. I always knew that I would never be one of those people that sits behind a desk and shoves mm-hmm. around paperwork. Kudos to them if that's what they're going to do. Or And trust me when I say I'm not good with numbers. So that was never going to be my um, my way of making money either. So, but I was always good with my hands. Mm-hmm. I loved, absolutely loved modeling, loved um, painting, loved doing anything with my hands. And I loved talking. Mm-hmm. I loved working with people and I loved understanding people, what makes them tick. So it's, and obviously um, my, I, I came from an Asian family, South Asian family, and that contributed um, a lot. My dad's a surgeon, my bro- older brother's a dentist, my brother-in-law was a dentist, um, Families, fam, families full of either um, medics, dentists, or teachers. Mm-hmm. So I, it's kind of made sense for me to follow um, through into one of those fields. And I, healthcare, I always wanted to do. Actually, when I was younger, I wanted to be a pediatrician, and um, I thought for a long time that's what I would do. But when it came to look cho- choosing at A level, I decided to go for dentistry because um, my my um my father, as I said, was a surgeon. My my uh, older brother was a dentist. And when I looked at their two lifestyles, I just felt my fa- my brother's lifestyle was more compatible with the sort of lifestyle I wanted in the future. I want I knew that, and I didn't want to do teaching for the same reason. It's very um calculated my decision to make to do dentistry, in that I knew I wanted my you know perfect family, two point four children, and mm-hmm. I wanted to work part time, and I wanted to be able to earn it. Um, enough in that part time such that if I needed to, I could support the children on my own and not have to be dependent upon another, uh, my, my partner, just in case, you know, things go wrong. Um, and, you know, that that was my aim. I couldn't do that through teaching. I couldn't do that through medicine. I felt it would have been too demanding if I was on my own. So dentistry became the choice and the way to go. And also, I had models in front of me for dentistry. Mm-hmm. I didn't have models in front of me for medicine. Women who'd done it, there weren't enough. Now there are. Now, if a 16-year-old came up to me and said, I'm going to choose dentistry because it fits in more with family life, I'd say, are you mad? But it's all about seeing examples of women li- and, you know, women or men, depending upon what gender you are, in front of you that do life, that are of your heritage, do life the way you want to do and manage it. 
So because there were none of those models when I was younger in medicine or less of them, I chose dentistry. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I love it. I'm really glad I chose dentistry because the manual dexterity element of it, the working with my hands, I love working with my hands. I love talking to people. I love working with anxious patients. Um, and it's it's a skill, mm -hmm. isn't it? It's I mean, I know I'm old school, but you know, carving that amalgam just <laughs> perfectly, you know, it's 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 a skill, mm -hmm. and I know I do it well, um, and I know I handle my patients well, and they're happy for the most part. So, yeah, amazing. Did you have any other passions though prior to it? Did you want to do anything else, or was it always going to be healthcare? Reason why I ask is because I had this conversation uh, recently with with another guest on the podcast, and um, he was quite surprised to hear that South Asian families will push their kids more towards you know these careers. Mm. And uh, you know, um, uh, he was telling us about how his kids have not gone into dentistry at all, and he was quite surprised to hear how you know in our culture it tends to be you're either going to be medicine. Dent, you know, doctor, dentist, mm. lawyer, you mentioned mm. teacher. You know, it's very, very quite rigid what we go into. Did you have any other passions? Well, there's a reason for that too. I'll answer that yeah. question in two, two go phrases, if I may. The first reason is, is that we have a history of immigration as mm -hmm. South Asians. And what's the most stable thing an immigrant can do? A stable job which can be transplanted from India or Pakistan to Europe or to the U.S.? medicine absolutely you know yeah. dentistry these are stable careers which you, wherever you are they will go so it's not it's almost this within asian people this desire to do this career such as medicine or dentistry which is a stable and maybe boring career for some, some people is born of a desire to be safe of a desire that if you have to flee you will still be safe you will mm. still be needed you will still be stable you will still be able to make your income so i know a lot of people myself included, feel frustrated at this um, tendency. We as Asians have to push this, you know, healthcare drive or this teaching drive or lawyer drive, but it is born of a desire to survive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important to understand. Uh, you know, our our culture, the South Asian culture, has so many things running through which are, which are traced back. You know, it's from that insecurity. And so it's important to understand that. If your parents do push you into that, and my parents didn't, may I say, my mother right. actually wanted me to do teaching. Mm -hmm. My father wanted, did want me to do medicine, so he was disappointed I chose dentistry. Uh -huh. My mother always thought teaching, little did she know how difficult that is, and when my sister became one, she realized. My actual passion, mm -hmm. apart from fine art, would have been English literature. Right. I absolutely loved English literature at A-level. I struggled at A-level. I had a few family and personal mishaps, we, you know, at school we lost a friend and then lost, um, you know, grandparents and there was other problems. So it was, A levels were a difficult time for me. And, and my English teacher pushed me, kept wanting me to apply for English at university, but I didn't. I stuck to my guns and applied for dentistry. Mm -hmm. And um, if I had done something else, I would have loved to teach English to, a bit like Dead Poets Society, showing my age now, that's an old movie. It's a um, great movie. It's a great movie, exactly. So I would have loved to inspire young minds. If that was your passion, why do you not go down that route? Because I wanted the security right. <laughs> fair, of fair. being in a job which yeah. I could um, support my children with independently without having to depend upon anyone else. Okay. And I thought dentistry gave me that option and it also provided me the option of doing a job where I was talking to people, communicating with people and using my hands. Mm -hmm. So... So it ticked all the boxes. Ticked all the boxes. And you love it. And I love it, which, which is, is fortuitous. Yeah, fortuitous. Exactly. That's great. So um, how old are your children? I have two boys mm -hmm. and they are 15 and 13. Going wow. to be 16 and 14. Oh, wow, really? So, yes. Yes. They're um, young men now. Amazing. They are yeah. young men now. And the oldest is doing his GCSEs. And he continues to amaze me every single day. And the youngest is picking his GCSEs and he amazes me in different ways every single day. They're just, honestly, it's just, it's it's the biggest test in life, isn't it? Being a good parent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so one of the things that I'm, I'm picking up on and, uh, you know, we're talking about your uh, career choice. And I think you knew very early on that you wanted to have children, start yes. a family. And that influenced your career choice? 
Yes, it definitely influenced my career choice. It definitely influenced my career pathway. So I always knew that I wanted to be a young mother. Mm -hmm. So um, I was very fortuitous to meet my husband pretty much straight out of dental school. Um, and he felt the same that, you know, once we'd spent a few years together, we, we wanted to get started with the family. So I didn't focus on doing it. I mean, I did in my first few years, I did, you know, did a Botox course, did facial aesthetics course, did acupuncture. Um, first few years I did those, but then I knew I was going to have children. So I sort of um, was focused more on just getting my dent basic general dentistry really good, yeah. um, which I did. And then after four, year four years of practice, I had my first child. Um, and then two years later, I had my second child. Mm. Now, for me, it was really important. And this I'm not saying the way I did things is the right way to do things. But my life choice was that I wanted to, if at all able... I was able to to work part time because I wanted to spend as much time as I possibly could with the children when they were young. I did psych in my integrated BSc, and in that my main module was um, lifespan development, and it made me paranoid about making sure my kids had a really stable first, you know, zero to seven years. They were really good and stable, so I um I I, I chose to for the first next ten years of my life from like twenty eight to thirty eight. Yeah take a back seat in dentistry, just to work two, three days a week. I actually ended up working four days towards, you know, towards the latter as the kids got into towards senior school. Um, but in the first early years, I only worked two days and then three days. So really my career took a back seat. I only worked a maximum of three days up until they were both, um, in, while they were both in primary school. And only when they got to senior school did I up to four days. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and that's when I started looking at doing um, further stuff to upskill, um, you know, doing the anterior prep courses and whatever. Um, but then, yeah, life took a different turn. <laughs> Which way? Well, um, is that is that we talking? Yeah, with my health. So with your health. Yeah, yeah. So I did. Um, uh, I did a course. I think in early nineteen, summer nineteen, and I noticed during the course that um, I wasn't quite as my hand didn't, I wasn't able to do 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 the prep on the phantom heads as well as I went, wanted to and things like that. But I thought it's probably just because it's an acrylic tooth. It just something just didn't feel quite right to me. Anyway, but during the it wasn't two thousand nineteen, sorry, two thousand eighteen. Um, as as the year progressed at work, I found that I couldn't use the mouse very well at work. So when I used the mouse, um, uh, my ring finger on my right hand would accidentally keep depressing the right button on the mouse. Mm -hmm. I was like, what's that about? You know, what's going on here? And um, that happened to September, October. In November, I finally said to my husband, I said, you know, on my right hand, you know, I keep pressing the right button on the um, mouse rather than the left. And it does it and it brings up a wrong men the wrong menu completely. What's going on? What do you think it could be? And do you think it's a trap nerve? He goes, yeah, maybe, Shepherd. Why don't you try shifting over the mouse to your left side? because um, I'm slightly ambidextrous, use it with your left hand and give your right arm a rest. And if it doesn't resolve, then just book in with a physio. So that was December 18, mm. November, December 18. And then I did that for a while. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't getting much better. So um, I, we decided that, you know, I'd cut out caffeine and a few other things and see if that helped. Um, I still hadn't booked in with a physio at this point. Well, anyway, so come February 2019 was my 40th birthday. So I went to London. We had a nice, lovely party with all my friends from university mm -hmm. and stuff. And my mother and father were there as well. My mama said to me, um, Shafiq, whenever I touch your right side, for the past few months, I've been noticing a bit of a tremor. It's like under your skin. She goes, I, I just feel it. So your mom picked up on that. Did you not pick up on that? Or? Well, no? my husband and I, I yeah. guess when you're in the thick of it all the time, also mother sixth, sixth sense, but my husband and I had noticed things like I tremor a lot when I'm cold. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I'd had other, a few other problems like my right ankle would um, s swell spontaneously sometimes um, or I would fall, I used to fall a lot my right ankle would just give way and I would fall um, but we hadn't really put all the dots together we figured something wasn't quite right I was very tired a lot of the time um, had a lot of the non-motor symptoms as well without even realising so anyway um, no, we, we'd picked up things weren't quite right but we thought, you know, I had too much coffee or something like that so we just... I don't know. We no, maybe we're in denial to some degree. Mm. I don't know. But um, he, I mean, picked it up first of all, and she said to me, um, "Chef, go see your doctor." And I said, "Oh, I'm booked in. I'll go book in with a physio. I'm sure it's just a trapped nerve." So, 
in March 2019, I finally booked in and went to go see the physio. And the physio did a few tests. He um, he got me to do like the finger tap test type thing. Mm -hmm. And like, I couldn't do it. I can do it now, but I couldn't do it then because I wasn't on any medication. I couldn't move my, I could, my left hand, sorry, my left hand, I could do it fine with. But my right hand, I couldn't, even now I, I'm, my meds are, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. So <laughs> my mm. meds aren't working as well. But, um, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't touch each of my fingers with my thumb. And it's very strange. I, I hadn't noticed it. I was able to do everything else properly. And I was so shocked and so upset. And he goes, I'm really sorry to say this, Mrs. Ali, but I don't think it's a peripheral nerve problem. You need to go see your, your GP. And he did me a referral letter. And then I tucked that away for a little while. And my husband and I both modeled over things. Um, and then finally we made a GP appointment, which we got around... April time, I think it was April, May. Um, so there was a little bit of a lag. I think Ramadan came in between and a bit of denial maybe um, as well. We got an, another friend to look at me in between. Anyway, GP finally saw me. And by this point in time, my husband and I, because this was like April, I think now, or May, I can't remember anymore. Anyway, um, at this point in time, my husband had been assessing me more carefully. Mm. Um, and he'd actually sat me down um, we were fiddling with some wires for the internet or stuff fixing in the house and we were sat down by a radiator fixing these wires and he goes, Shafak, I've been watching you and I'm really sorry, but I do think something's really wrong. And I said, um, oh, because separately I've been thinking something was really wrong as well and separately been Googling things and, you know, Dr. Google. Mm. And he goes, Shafak, I do think that it might be Parkinson's disease. And I was like, hmm, well, I was thinking it might be that as well. And I said, well, why do you think it might be that? And then he told me, he noticed things like when I in the, was eating my evening meal, I was using my left hand to pull the fork instead of my right hand, which is, um, I'm right-sided, so that was unusual for me. He'd noticed that when I was walking, I'd stopped swinging my right arm. Um, he noticed that um, when I was talking, I would gesture mainly with my left hand and no longer my right hand which before I used to gesture with both hands. And these things happened so s slowly and so gradually that, you know, what like you said, well, how come you guys didn't notice? It just, we noticed and we looked back and these things have been happening for the best part of 10 years. Well, as I long thought, as that, huh? yeah, as long as that, wow. uh, uh, not long after my second son was born. So we thought that it was just, I got cold and I was shaking, but actually it was a tremor would induced by anything, anxiety, tiredness, anything. And it was only on my right side, but we'd never really noticed that it was just my right side. Yeah, he would notice I was cold and he'd be like, oh, come here, I'll give you a cuddle. And, and you know, that we didn't never really noticed it was just unilateral. So because of these things which had happened, he'd been observing me more keenly and I had been Googling things. And recently a cousin of mine, um, her mother-in-law had, um, passed away with complications from Parkinson's disease. So it was at the forefront of my mind as well. So I sort of, I remember Googling things like, what could Parkinson's be be the reason why your ring finger moves on of, it, of its own account, a, a cord? And things like that. I had noticed sometimes my fingers would just, you know, do things themselves and, and they hurt. My hand hurt. My shoulder hurt um, a lot. And it wasn't, it was like having frozen shoulder. Um, I, you know, my sons would pass the belt forward to me. It was it was a whole horde of things. Anyway, when we went to go see the GP, more or less went to the GP, my husband and I both together and said, we think I've got Parkinson's disease. They looked at me and they said, well, what makes you think that? And we said X, Y, Z. And they said, okay. And fortuitously, I then got a referral rather promptly to um, the, the neurologist in um, Doncaster. Uh, she just started, she was a new neurologist, so she didn't have a waiting list, which is why I went to Doncaster rather than Leeds or Pinders. Um, and uh, I was really lucky because I got seen in July, and I think it was July the 3rd, 2019. Poor lady, she must have run so late. I was the first patient of the morning, and you could see the slight shock in her face when she was doing the tests on me. And they do a huge host of neurological tests on you. And she was with me for an hour before she sat me down and she confirmed that I did indeed have what she thought was young onset Parkinson's disease. Um, at that point, my husband excused himself to have a few moments to himself. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I said, oh, right, I thought so. Like, I must have sounded so, like, such a plonker. But I was like, yeah, oh, right, OK, never mind. What do we do now type thing? But it was just my shock, um, you know, trying to just, ha you know, still maintain some composure in the face of the somewhat of a spanner in the work, so to speak. That's a big spanner. Yeah, and I just <clears throat> remember sitting in the car park at Asdo on the way back from work one day. I stopped to get milk or something, and um, a friend of mine had full thing, decided to call and just see how I was doing. Yeah. And I just sat and I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed and I said to her, Shabu, her name's Shabina, and I said, Shabina, you know, anything, I could have had anything, but now, I, and, and it could have been worse, a lot worse, but I've got Parkinson's. I work with my hands. I could have been a teacher and it would have been okay. I could have been, you know, doing a, a pay, an office job and it would have been okay. But I work with my hands, Shabbat, and I love my job. How mm. am I going to do it? It was honestly, it was so horrible. I was, it, honestly, it took me a while to just come around to the fact that, you know, you're lucky you don't have a brain tumor. You're lucky you don't have so many other things. But it took me a little while to rebalance. And, I think I'm allowed. I, 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 I allowed myself that time. You know, it's, well, that it's okay. moment, that moment when you're sat there and you get the diagnosis and, you know, your husband has to excuse himself. Yeah. And you just say, oh, well, yeah, what do we do next? What was the real emotion? What really went through your mind at that stage? It was the real me was probably the one sitting in the car park sobbing to my friends saying, why Parkinson's when I've got a job that I love so much and I was just I was literally on the threshold of of doing it for me now mm. not just to earn money to pay the pay the nursery fees or the school fees or whatever it was now I was going to do my bit of dentistry do start training do the course that I just I'd already started doing the postgrad courses I was looking at postgrad diplomas to do and so on and so forth and and then I got this and I was like well what's the point What's the point of me doing any of this? Um, but you know what? Life throws you some spanners sometimes. And it's about, you know, I I, ha I was very, it sounds it sounds weird, but COVID came at the right time for me in that I'm, I, I wish it hadn't come at all. I wish it hadn't come at all. But if it was going to come, it probably came at the right time because my neurologist said to me, take six months out because I don't know how um, Parkinson's will be affected by this new um, condition and she goes I don't want to risk you getting it because it does affect your muscles a lot and I do have um, bulbar symptoms you know I, I'm coughing swelling I it's difficult for me sometimes um, so she didn't want me to get it initially so I was like okay so I took six months out and spending that time six months out with my children mm -hmm. um, I think it gave me time to readjust and rebalance and reassess everything and realize I'm here I'm breathing I'm still got my mind and I've got most of my function. I can do this. And you know what? I'm going to, whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to do well now. I might not be able to walk down the path I thought I was going to, but I'll forge a new path and I'll make sure I forge it damn well. <laughs> um, so I, that's what I'm trying to do now. Hi guys. Are you thinking about getting into dental implantology? Well, if you didn't know, I'm one of the founding members of Unique Implant Training. Unique Implant Training is now in its fifth year, and we are now fully EDUQUAL accredited to diploma level, which is an 18-month diploma, the only 18-month implant diploma currently in the UK. So if you want to begin your implant journey, please don't hesitate to give us a call. Find us at www.uniqueimplanttraining.co.uk. We look forward to seeing you soon. If you may ask, just... Those emotions, you know, I mean, you're on the other side of it now. There must have been a massive degree of uncertainty. What do I do now? What am I going to be able to do with my career? Were there any doubts that you were, you know, going to be able to continue doing what you do? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, again, the internet, Facebook pages, Parkinson's UK. My husband was a lifesaver. Like he read, I, I, like I said, I sort of went into that, oh, okay, so... Well, you know, a shocked sort of um, state. I was like, I was just functioning, looking after my children, dealing with them, distraction techniques for myself. Mm -hmm. Whereas he went in and he's, because he's a surgeon, he's a fixer. He's a, I can, I can sort, and it's his wife who's like, I will sort this out for my wife type thing. And he did all the research. He looked into all the papers, what studies are going on, where, um, what medication to take, what supplements to take. And 
you know, he was my rock, is my rock, but he was my rock then where I couldn't do the reading, where I was reeling. He was researching and holding my hand and until I was ready to stand again as opposed to just crawl, <laughs> which is what I felt like I was doing for a little while. And yeah, I was worried that in five years' time I wouldn't be able to do Parkinson's um, dentistry, but I also realised that each par person with Parkinson's, my husband, who is reading, reading, explained to me, has their own journey. Mm -hmm. And there's many things we can do to try and slow it down. So just because I have Parkinson's doesn't mean, doesn't mean I won't be doing dentistry in five years' time. And I'm already almost, I mean, four years in, four years in now, and I'm still doing dentistry, no problem. Well, some problems, but nothing major. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, 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 I used to joke I'd like to retire by 50. In reality, I probably will have to retire by 50, but it won't be my choice. But that's a good thing, huh? You can do lots of other things in your time. Yeah. So I just because I might not be able to use my hands as well as I wanted to and do the things I'd 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 plan to try and become this like snazzy private dentist, you know, and you know, um do all these courses, do all these wonderful smiles and have us I wanted I wanted to work with phobic patients and do like hypnosis and sedation and, and nitrous and every I wanted to do that sort of stuff and I still do the IV sedation, and I, but I'm, I'm not going to be setting up my own phobia clinic now. Unless, you know, it's just not going to happen. But I've got other things I can do, and I focus on that now instead. And and it is, it honestly, Parkinson's. It's not anything I'd ever wish upon anyone, and I don't know how long I'm going to be good for. Uh, you know, I'm four years in now. Five years is supposed to be the honeymoon period, so I do worry now, and it's horrible because you know when you're doing your work and at work and like I was saying to my nurse yesterday I was saying Rihanna it's horrible when you're doing a crown prep or you're doing an extraction you're thinking am I doing it as well as I did it last week am I doing it as well as I did it the week before that you're constantly crit critiquing yourself and analyzing yourself in a way you didn't do so before and you're trying to make sure you're doing your best by your patient all the time because the minute I feel like I'm not doing it right anymore I will have to step back from dentistry because that is the only ethical thing to do um, and the correct thing to do but that constant thinking constant mm -hmm. assessing of oneself is fatiguing um, but I'm still fortunate enough that I'm able to do that because I'm still doing dentistry so it's always a case of yes looking at the negative but trying to remind myself well, at least you're still able to do that you just still able to assess you, that fact that you how am I how am I crap and props and preps now are they still okay you know, um, so I don't know how it will affect my dentistry. I've stopped trying to predict the future. I've tried very much to just live in the present, you know. My my younger son's such a corn. I don't know. I think it was Finding Nemo or something like that. The present is called the present, mummy, because it is a present. It was Finding <laughs> Nemo, maybe or something like that. And and he he loves that. And but it quite literally is a present. But the other thing is that Parkinson's in itself has been. I wouldn't say it was a gift. It. You know, I I, I do refer to it as like a, a gift wrapped in spiky wrapping paper. It's made me reassess everything and made me really appreciate that which I have now. And the fact that I, as a person, still have power to do things to, even if that which I wanted to do isn't uh, no longer possible. There's other things I can do which can still make a difference, and that's what's important to me. As a dentist, especially in NHS dentistry, you feel like you're working for charity anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you you feel like you're doing good for people. You feel like you're making a change to people, and I. I thrive off of that. I probably sound a bit like a narcissist or something, you know, like, but I, I love it when people are like happy to see me because I've helped them. Yeah. And that gives me, it gives a feeling of self-worth, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's really actually interesting and refreshing to hear that because, um, you know, the trend is when we were having our initial communications, a lot of young dentists now, most young dentists, I would say, would never envisage working on the NHS, would never find it a rewarding pathway. And, uh, you know, um, I've explored <coughs> with with other guests the reasons behind that. So I'm not saying, you know, it's unfair to say that young dentists just don't see the value in it. They've got their own things that they have to deal with. But the NHS can be extremely rewarding, mm. can't it? And, um, you know, for, for, for many reasons as well, which you've touched upon, I mean, we touched very briefly upon motherhood there. You know, yeah. the, the, the fact that you have fantastic... 
maternity package, paternity Absolutely. package as well. Yes. You know, it helps because, uh, you know, in our, in, in, in my wife's a dentist as well. Okay. And with our first child, we had maternity, which was fantastic. With our second child, we didn't. Uh, and you felt I, it. I, and we felt it. We felt it. And uh, that influenced our decision to have a third, which we didn't have. And I think that was the same with yourself. Is that right? Yeah, we didn't have a third either. Yeah. It was exactly the same thing. It's just that my husband was um, was working uh, as, as a surgeon. He was trained to be a consultant urologist. So really, really hard training. And then he did a PhD in between. And the nursery fees were humongous. I didn't want to work more days. Um, so we decided that not to have a third for multiple reasons but yes uh, finance definitely had a had a key role to play as well because it's just yeah mm -hmm. yeah but there's so many i mean i have this conversation with my wife quite a lot and with other colleagues and you know it's it is tough for for for, for mums for women you know taking that time out uh from the career uh to to, to start raising a family yeah and obviously I'm a dad and tried my very, very best, but mum did take most of the role in, in, in the early years of, of, of bringing them up. And obviously that, you know, career took a back seat because of that. Yeah. And, you know, just listening to your story, you know, putting things on the back burner and now was your time to go for it. And then Parkinson's came along. Yeah. You're extremely, extremely positive about all this. And, you know, the, the gift that you were given with the spiky wrapping paper... You know, it's a lovely way to describe it, but, you know, you're very, very strong. But that period, that period, you know, that diagnosis, there must be some dark, dark days there. Was there any support for you? There was support for me. Um, the main support I needed was my husband, to be honest with mm -hmm. you, and my children. But to be honest, I don't think... They were dark days, but they weren't prolonged periods of darkness. They were dark moments, maybe, rather than dark days. Every day for me has happiness in it. I'm really lucky. You know, touch wood, I'm really, really lucky. I have. I was born with a quite positive <laughs> outlook in life. And my mum and my father, I don't know what they did to me, whether they, you know, fed me happy stuff. I don't know what they did, but I, I generally speaking, have quite a happy outlook in mm -hmm. life. And I try and be positive. So... Even though I had dark moments, I did have dark days. Um, uh, they weren't prolonged. And I think having my children, having, you know, nice weather around me. It was summer when I was diagnosed. So, you know, it was it just it just really helped having my friends, my family. And also, I mean, I didn't actually resort to any of these, but I knew that if I needed to, there were organizations I could turn to. Mm -hmm. One of the organizations being the Benevolent, BDA Benevolent Fund. Yeah. So that was, it was a really important resource for me to know that not only were they my friends and family, but had I been, you know, stuck in any way financially, I could resort to something like the BDA Benevolent Fund to help me. Um, fortunately, I was part of a joint income. I mean, when I had to go on sick, well, after the um, after COVID happened, I, the sick pay was ridiculous because um, I'd only been working day and a half in um, the practice I was at and still am at because I'd been working privately in another practice for a little while. So I had no no cover from the private practice, and the day and a half sick pay, well, you can imagine it wasn't much. Mm -hmm. So I really and and you know we made the choice to send our children to private school, which is our choice. I understand that, but it obviously affected the finances too. So, um, yeah, if it hadn't been for the fact that we were a joint income family, I definitely would have really struggled not only mentally, but also financially as well. So knowing that there was the backup of um, organizations within our profession, like the BDA Benevolent Fund, was really, really, it was heartening. And it was, I was glad that even though I didn't need it, I, I becoming aware of the fact as I was doing my research that there were organizations like this out there was reassuring to me. Then I also became involved with Parkinson's UK, which has been amazing. It's really given me a purpose um, to feel like I'm, you know, partaking in a community and, a, and doing good for people. Um, so, uh, yeah, overall, I had dark days, but there was the support, both um, physically having friends and family around me um, and uh I was always, um, I always see through the BDA Benevolent Fund, I always knew that I could also access um, 
counseling if I needed it as well. It wasn't just financial support. So that was important. So I didn't need any of those things. But knowing that anything was available to me if I needed it, mm -hmm. I think that in itself is a feeling of reassurance, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I didn't even know that it existed until we started communicating about it. So please, can you explain what the BDA Benevolent Fund is? I can indeed. Yeah. So um, the BDA Benevolent Fund is a charity which started 140 years ago this wow. year. Um, so back in 1883, there was a chap, I can't remember his name, which isn't very good of me. But anyway, um, he, he, he felt there was a need to help dentists who were no longer able to work, their dependents and dental students. Actually, I don't know whether it was dental students at the beginning. Anyway, so he basically started it off. And in our first year, back in 1883, we actually helped something like eight people, of which some of them were like, there was there was a dentist with um, whose wife um, was physically um, less able. I don't know, she had some condition. And he, he became very nervous and had a breakdown, so he needed help. Then there was a, wo an, a woman with seven children who was widowed. She definitely needed financial help. Mm. And then there was another daughter who was completely orphaned, had no means of it, independent income. In 1883, there was nothing that these people would have been able to do. No, you know, no welfare state, nothing they could. So mm. the charity was very much needed from the from the in, its inception, get go. So you know, that's when it started. And ever since then, year on year, year on year, I kid you not, there's more and more applications coming through. And, you know, you'd think that maybe with the inception of the welfare state, things would have slowed down. No, no, they didn't. And um, if anything, again, it, the applications increased. And just on Saturday, I was at a dinner for the Yorkshire Centenary BDA mm. branch. And um, a chap there was telling me that, you know, he had hepatitis in the 80s and um, he couldn't work for a period of time, which was crucial for their family because he just had... Uh, and uh, a, a child um, so they needed a loan at that point in time um, and then there's another lady who um, lives in Jersey maybe and she um, basically she had a, this is more recent um, this is uh, she had a um, uh, baby and her baby little Amelia I believe her name was um, was born with some complications, so much so that the mum needed a liver transplant. Wow. So she had to be fly to London um, and have the liver transplant. And understandably, she was out of action for a lot longer than the six months. So um, when it came to, uh, you know, getting back to work, her funds, had, you know, her funds had depleted. She, you know, everyone always thinks dentists have lots of savings behind them. Yes, we might have savings, but sometimes if things like this happen, mm -hmm. your savings can get depleted. So... Um, she she um, came to us and she got a you know she was thinking oh my god and, you know um, ARF and indemnity and so on so we gave her a grant um, and so on and so forth the stories keep coming and you know it's it, it, we did think maybe there'll be a bit less need um, as time goes on but 140 years later we've realised that actually just more and more people are applying we've already had something like 20 applicants this this month and really? like, well just in this January month? yes wow okay yeah and it varies as well because initially the people that used to apply were older in age yeah. and now the applicants a lot of them are younger so I think in 2019 they were nearer 50 and in 2021 they were nearer 30 the average age um, and that's a lot to do with students because in um COVID times, for example, in 2019, we had 77 applicants um, uh, through the whole year. That was it. In 2020, post-COVID, we had 172 applicants. Wow. So, you know, it 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 really, you think maybe there's things are, let, you know, slowing down a bit and maybe there's less of a need, but then something like this happens and it shows you that there is definitely a need for a benevolent fund for you know, for Why the jump, if I ask, from 77 to 177, say? COVID. COVID. Lockdown. As in, what type of issues are they having? So, the mental issues... Mental health or...? Uh, some people were having mental health problems, yeah. yeah, and so they had to... And there was a lot of people having to go off sick. Um, but apart from that, there was um, a lot of associate principal disputes, mm -hmm. which led to um, financial hardship for many associates. Um, then there was students... Who still had to pay rent for the flats they lived in, but all their jobs had dried up. There was no more waiting, waiting jobs going around because no restaurants and bars were open. 
So a lot of students applied in, during that year as well, and a, a lot of associates. And the main reason they were applying again was sick pay, um, financial disputes with the so, with their um, principal, um, or they were off sick themselves wow. with COVID. Wow. Oh, well, I would wish I never have to apply for myself. I hope you never have to. But um, it's great to know that something like that exists, yeah. and I wasn't even aware of it. You know. Mm. Well, they also provide. Um, you know, like um, uh, bereavement counselling, which is important. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something a lot of people after path, um, COVID will could use, um, unfortunately. And then there's just counselling full stop. And then there's financial help as well, like um, in in the fact that we have forms on the on the website that you can set download and use to try and get your affairs in order and things like that. So it, I mean, it's not just about the money. We do try and be a holistic organisation. Um, I say we because I became a trustee in mm -hmm. last year, last summer, which is one of the things I've done post Parkinson's diagnosis. Amazing. Um, you know, since you've had your diagnosis, you've obviously turned it into um, a situation where you can do good things, you know, and, yeah. and, and help people, which is so lovely and uh, amazing to hear. And you do, you do other things as well, don't you? So you, um, I'll just, if you don't mind me, just, parking both of them you do stuff on facebook with mental dental in that facebook group don't you mm -hmm. and you also work with confidential i do i do confidential being is that a it's a call line it's a call line yeah it's dental call okay. line so um com um mental dental was started by lauren i think in back i was still in newcastle when it first started so mm -hmm. it would have been six seven years ago um and initially we had lots and lots of, I mean, there was a lot, of, a big need for it initially, I think, as um, people came through with their different stories, like different stories, whether it be uh, a lot of the younger students, younger, not students, sorry, graduates were very stressed about the whole um, litigation issue. So uh, fear of litigation has crippled a lot of the younger dentists is one of the things we found. Um, so something like mental dental where they can post anonymously questions because mm -hmm. um, back in whenever it was established there wasn't this anonymous feature um that you have now on facebook so uh, uh, yeah uh, an anonymous way of putting your questions forward without knocking your confidence because young graduates you know i mean forget young graduates anyone at any point in time can be vulnerable and insecure but especially when you're working just starting out in a professional field so they would have concerns about you know, if they've done something and um, or if they've had a, a patient make a complaint um, and this will be somewhere they could come and literally blurt out all their anxieties and worries and the good people of the dental profession would try and support them. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of goodness there. I know there's lots of probably lots of pleasant things going on as well, but... Where you want to look for the good, you can find it in this mental dental Facebook page because a lot of people do try um, and help and listen and support. Um, but there's a few of us administrators on the page, and we, uh, um, although we had a lot of traffic initially through the first few years, and it slowed down a bit now, we still do have a, a, a consistent amount of you know people coming through, and the problems are always the same. Pretty much always litigation and worried about you know, something they might have done or uh, uh, disputes, a lot of disputes get discussed as well. Disputes between... Yeah, principals principal and associates. Principal associates. Or, or, um, or <coughs> patient, patients and dentists as well. So. Okay. Mm. And is that the same with Confidential? Confidential, a lot of it is the same as well, to be honest. Um, a lot of that is, you know, sometimes there's substance abuse comes up in Confidential as well. Um, sometimes it's just someone having a bad day. And they just want to talk about it. That it can literally just be that you know, when all your friends are dentists, and you just want to talk to someone about it without it being a friend who's going to judge you because you've done something silly. Because nothing is silly, really. Um, we're all clever people. We've gone into a degree called dentistry and gotten through it, so we're all clever people. But sometimes you can doubt yourself, and when you're doubting yourself and you don't quite want to air those doubts to anyone else. That's where Confidential comes in. Mm -hmm. um, so we have an on-call rotor. Um, there's several of us uh, on the on-call rotor. And um, you can just call up if you've had a bad day, if you're getting, you know, if you've got litigation going on, if you've got concerns about a, a lot of nurse and dentists, you know, I don't get on with my nurse or my nurse is winding me up or um, my, you know, 
marital disputes is another one which comes in. I mean, it's not necessarily always to do with dentistry, Amazing. confidential. It can sometimes be marital disputes as well. Mm -hmm. um, it can be anything and everything. It's j literally just a call line for dentists to call up and let out any of their stresses. It's amazing. Guys, as you know, I am the lead tutor of the Hedro Academy Vertical Preparation course. Now, we have put together this beautiful vertical preparation kit, which has been beautifully made by former dental supplies. Simon at Former has kindly agreed to give one lucky winner uh, of this podcast a kit completely, completely free of charge, uh, which retails normally at £220 plus VAT. So all you have to do to win one of these fantastic vertical preparation kits is just give us a like, uh, subscribe to the podcast and share it and leave a comment below and we will pick one lucky winner every podcast and uh, Burkitt will be finding itself uh, in your clinic. Okay, so yeah, great guys. The Horacle Burkitt by Hedro Academy and former dental supplies. You mentioned for the Facebook group initially when we started talking about that one that it's mainly young dentists. Is yes. that right? Mainly young dentists or is it dentists of all... Um, kind of age ranges or is it mainly the young dentists which are having a hard time of it? I do think I mean I don't really ask them their age but they all look <laughs> mm -hmm. look younger than 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 what yeah than they do older <laughs> so yeah. the majority of them are younger. And they've kind of got this fear of of litigation. It is and a I think, huge thing. I mean I was I was I was a foundation trainer for for, for a decade mm. and uh, I left it because just it was it was becoming more and more difficult just the environment of, of foundation training has become more and more difficult. Um, great people coming out of university, but yeah, something's changed somewhere. And this fear, this constant fear of litigation, and it's like, you know, promoting defensive dentistry. Mm. Where does it come from? Why is it happening? What do you think? I think it's come from social media. Some of it, um, some of it's come across from the states. Um, a lot of it is about these, and and there's obviously all the legal organisations out there now that promote and advertise. We can help you sue your dentist, but they don't quite say it like that. But they may as well. Mm. Um, so it's a culture which has been developing and growing. I think since the '90s, to be honest. But when we first graduated from dental school, I don't think it was as prevalent. But as with anything, it grows over time. And it's grown to such a point now where I feel it is quite malignant. And unfortunately, the younger graduates do feel this malign force, so to speak. <laughs> and to be honest, when I was at dental school and I graduated, they said, um, don't worry if you have a case come against you. There's not one, every dentist you speak to, at least one dentist will have been sued or tried to be sued at some point in time during their life. So don't worry about it. When that first letter comes, it's okay. It happens just to everyone. Just hand it off to the indemnity. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's more than that now. It's not just everyone will have at least one case. No, I, I think that's the thing. People are trying. They're like a lot more now. And what's happening, and I may be wrong, but my perception is that because people are anxious when they about this from the offset, they, they're, not, they're, they're not as confident. And it comes through the lack of confidence sometimes comes through in their choices. So everyone would much rather do a composite veneer. Not that I'm saying it doesn't require talent to do a composite veneer, mm. but um, uh, doing a composite veneer would require talent, I suppose. But they would much rather do a composite than they would rather do a, a crown prep or um, a veneer prep, a good veneer prep. You know, that, that, that requires a lot of skill. And then s the cementation and the maintenance and making sure you've got the, you know, it, it's it's something which they, they has made them turn away from doing the more intricate and complicated types of dentistry to something which is um, perceived to be less complicated, like composite veneers, because composite veneers are all in your hand. Mm -hmm. There's no lab lab involved. And actually, composite veneers can be a minefield as well, as I'm sure yeah. you've probably very, seen. Very, very difficult to do well, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. And, you know, it, you know people screw up the gum, the, you know, the gingival margin, they'll end up with inflammation and all sorts and the bites go yeah but because it's all in your hand there's the false idea there that you feel like you've got it all in your control so people are trying to 
what I find is it's also not just directing um, this fear of malign, this malign sort of fear of what's going on around you. Directs not only what um, de young dentists do, but it's also directing the path, the way dentistry is going forward. Like you said, they're choosing what they perceive to be easier options, like private dentistry, like doing composite veneers, because they perceive it to be easier, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. It isn't. And actually, long term, the, the, we will feel it as dentists, as a profession, we will feel it. Um, not only will, will we, obviously, and we already are, feel the, the masses of dentists who aren't even entering the NHS sphere, um, but we'll also feel the repercussions of, um, you know, this composite veneering business and all the rest of it as well. And I'm not saying that composite veneers aren't good. Please don't get me wrong. No, no, of I course. I think they're not. Yeah. You're, only, you're only as good as a person, that the product is only as good as a person who knows how to do it so type thing mm -hmm. if that makes sense no it does it does and a couple of things that you've touched on there um which 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 i can so say yes and relate to is when we we went to the same university mm. i would yes i was told exactly what you were just uh mm. saying there that you know you're probably going to get sued maybe once in your career mm. and when that letter lands on your doormat you just simply hand it over yep. to the indemnity company don't worry about it it happens yeah, yeah? i think i'd love to get a new graduate on and just really understand what that whole process is now the teaching about managing you know a complaint because mm. they i could just see it and this is one of the reasons for doing the podcast i could just see the stress and the anxiety with these uh, i can't, can't call them kids they're adults but these young dentists yeah. they just have this anxiety and it provokes defensive dentistry and where then does anxiety come from the anxiety in terms of anxiety generally the emotion where does it come from it comes from a a fear doesn't it fear yeah Wait, well, let's explore that a fear of what and exactly. what do you think i i was talking to um one of my fellow trustees at the benevolent fund the other day and he was telling me that um at a lot of universities you'll be shocked to hear this if you don't already know this they no longer teach flaps and sutures and surgical removal of teeth as undergraduate that has now progressed to the postgraduate syllabus. Because really? Of, because of money. Because of money. Yeah. And that shocked me. So if I, what causes anxiety when you don't feel in control? You don't feel in control and you when don't you feel don't, competent. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So that's what causes anxiety. I mean, that's, that's the whole reason that so many people are on anxiolytics nowadays because the world is going so fast. No one feels like they have control anymore and that lack of control is causing um, you know, anxiety to run high amongst people. Forget people within dentistry. A lot of the young dentists, they know what they're doing. They have been taught everything. But have they been taught everything like we were in previous years? I don't think so. Does that make them better dentists? Not necessarily. Does it make them worse dentists? Not necessarily. Does it make them not as confident? Yes. That's the key, right? Because, the, okay. yeah, yeah. And, and not always. I, I would like to think not all of them, but the ones that I speak, I have spoken to, they are saying this, that, look, I went into the dental field. Uh, I mean, they were telling me about, I mean, this isn't, it's a therapist. They were telling me about, once someone was telling me about a therapist. And um, they were saying that these therapists graduated um, without ha ever having used an ultrasonic well. scanner. <laughs> and that's the same sort of thing which is going on within dentistry as well, especially post-COVID. And, and it's, it's going to cause anxiety. They are going to be stressed. And it's not fair. It's we not are doing fair. a disservice to them as a community de yeah. of educators and dentists. And we need to pull together. And why would you, when you hear, when you go onto Facebook and you see all this bashing of NHS dentists and it happens, it's like, it's it's quite a ha-ha, he-he sort of environment. And mm. I know it's all said in jest. Um, but I don't think that this younger generation full stop with regards to whether dentists or not are as thick skinned as previous generations probably were. They are far more sensitive and that's lovely in some ways because, you know, they're more attuned to other people. They're kinder probably than our generation was. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely the generation above was maybe, <laughs> but um, it, it also makes them more sensitive too when they read these things. 
like NHS dent- dentistry it's rubbish and you can't even do um you know you don't even have enough time to breathe or do decent fillings or do this and that and yes there's lots wrong with wrong with NHS dentistry and it's a skill to be able to work within NHS dentistry and yes it is pushed but I still find it enjoyable and I still find that I can do good not perfect mm-hmm and yes, I know it could be better. Yes, I know I can do better. But with what I have in my hand, I do the best that I can. And this is what I think people full stop, dentists full stop, younger or older need to accept that sometimes if we all leave the NHS dentist scheme, it's not going to work. It's just, and that's what some people want probably. But I work in Barnsley, dude. Mm-hmm. You know, they really. <laughs> you know, yes, some of them could afford den plan. Some of them yeah. could afford, but some of them, I mean, can't. There's got to be a service there for for, for the people that need yeah. it, right? And people have to be able to work in that service and provide a decent service exactly. and get job satisfaction from it at the same time yes. as well. Though it's just so difficult to tie everything together, isn't it? Uh, the reason why I started doing this is because I can just see such a disconnect within the profession. And I just want to try and get to the bottom of it. I never will get to the bottom of it, but I just want to start to understand myself and just tie all these things together. So we have an older generation which look at the younger generation and just see them as snowflakes for want of a better Mm -hmm. phrase. But hands up, I was a little bit of that attitude. But Mm -hmm. since I've started talking to people through this podcast, it's kind of just like, you know what? We are not preparing our young dentists for life in dentistry. It's not their fault. And I've completely flipped my attitude. I think, you know what? We need to train them better. Yes. We need to be more sympathetic towards them, don't we? And I think we just need to be a little bit kinder. (laughs) Kinder. That is exactly it. I think, you know, the previous generations were very rough and... I mean, not rough and ready generally as people, but just, you know... Because they grew up, uh, people in the 80s, dentistry was very different. You didn't even wear gloves, for heaven's sake, in the mm. early 80s. So it was very different. It was just a different world. There's a lot more, I don't know, I wasn't I wasn't a dentist in the 80s. But the expectation was, and I was talking to uh, Tony Kilcoyne about this, because he was uh, one of the first implementers of foundation training. Mm. You know, he, was, he was the first TPD at the, uh, on the Dewsbury scheme when it was voluntary. And it was expected, and it still was in our day to some degree, that you would graduate and then end up just going straight into a job, seeing mm. 40 a day. Now, obviously, we had VT in between, but even our VT was usually about, what, 20, 25 patients mm-hmm. a day? It was yep. it was expected that you would do that, and we were going to go and work in the NHS and do this volume of work. And then slowly, 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 it changed to, you know what, maybe the NHS isn't for me. And I think the conclusion with Tony was we're preparing graduates now for mixed practice rather than just solely working on the NHS. Mm. But it's kind of just, they're not they're not getting the training at an undergraduate level now, especially if you're telling me that they're not cutting flaps or even learning nope. how to suture. Nope. You know, they're not getting the training that they need for real world dentistry. No. And that's where we're, we are letting them down. And that's where we do need to, as a profession, step up. And I don't know what, as a profession, you know, we we always moan and whinge, but because of the disconnect that is between all of us individually, because we're not like hospital surgeons or hospital doctors where we have these big hubs where we all come together and we all communicate and think we, we're all isolated. Mm. Um, and I, I think that creates a far more disconnected disconnect, community. Um, and it's far easier to blame others than it is to yourself. So because of the fact that we are disconnected... I feel there's not enough community strength to actually perpetuate change. And that's a shame, and that's what we need to work on. But so many people have tried to work on it because when the ARF was hiked, everyone tried to come together then and so on and so forth. But this education of dentists is so fundamental to our our profession. I think something really does need to be done about it because they're coming out and they're just scared. Um, I, I, I'm not. It's it's different. It's not that they're they're scared of in litigation, but they're also there's a lot of confidence there as well. I don't know whether it's false or not, but there's a lot of confidence there as well. Because again, I was talking to someone else earlier on, and they were saying, you know, dental students nowadays they'll have they'll they're not like I was back in the day. I don't know about you, <laughs> but you know, like 
if a, if, a, if a tutor is telling you to do a root canal treatment in a certain way or use a certain bond, they'll be like, but why, miss? You, because, or whatever it is, because there's this paper which says X, Y, Z, and there's that paper which says A, B, C. Mm-hmm. So why are you choosing this bond over the other bond? And, you know, I wouldn't have ever said that to my clinical tutors. And, and sometimes they can say things. I mean, I fit quite much something quite mild, but sometimes they can be quite audacious. Mm-hmm. If you speak to clinical tutors, they can be quite audacious. And I feel that that has come a long way because of the fact that we've got all these exams to get into dentistry itself now. You've got the, what's it called? UCAT. UCAT and yeah. BG, whatever it is anyway. That's mm. from it. Um, but um, you, students are coming into dentistry feeling like they're dentists already in, in a sense in that their knowledge base is much better than mine was when I first went mm-hmm. into dentistry. So they, they have all the theory and more than we ever had, yeah. I think. So in that respect, they are very confident and so they should be. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, they're, they're talented. They have to work harder than a lot of us. Well, I ever had. Actually, I know I worked really hard. But, yeah, uh, some people ever had to, to get into dentistry. They've worked very, very hard. They've got, I mean, even I did my A-levels, but I didn't have to do this extra exam. Yeah, exactly. And so, when I found know, out that they had to do this extra layer of examination to get into dental school, even just to get interviews, yep. I was just like, wow. You know, I, they've I, got it tough now. And it's not and, just... Yeah. They are clever kids. The clever kids, exactly. They? they are really Very clever kids going into dentistry now. Well, I would, I'd like to say I was clever when I went into it, but I think they're even another level that's, up that's from, what I mean. from, from our generation. Yeah. So, and and yeah. can't be talked down to because they don't deserve to be talked down to. They they deserve to... Be, they're not getting what they deserve. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I, I think so that needs to be addressed. So, yes, they're very confident in some ways, but they're not confident in other ways because unless that that clashes in their brain as well because they're young dentists they have an they have an idea about what a young dentist should be able to do and 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 then they get into the world and they realize it's not and that's why they then leave in droves and go to private dentistry because they can do the stuff they're confident doing with doing they don't need to bother about trying to do removal of lower left eight Mm -hmm. razor flap bone removal they don't need to do that if they don't want to you mm-hmm. can just do the composite veneers. Which another guest on the show described as sexy dentistry. Exactly. And everyone wants to do sexy dentistry, right? So, and Botox. Yeah. And fillers. And, and all the aesthetic stuff. And all that's, the aesthetic stuff. Must be driven by social media, right? It's driven by social media. And social media is changing everything, including the dental um, world. Mm-hmm. Um, because do you think turkey teeth would have taken off without Instagram or TikTok or no, whatever? Obviously they wouldn't have, would it? Exactly. So there was always dental tourism, but not like this. Not to this degree. No. no, definitely not to this degree. And it's it's yeah, the world is changing. The world is changing, and not always for the better. Unfortunately, it is changing in every way. Be that the way that our our students are taught, or the young dentist practice, or I practice. I do feel like you know, I I I feel in the twenty years I've been practicing. You know, I I used to do chrome dentures for my patients, not willy nilly. I wasn't silly about it. Mm. But I used to do them. If they had chrome dentures previously, I'd do them replace with chrome dentures. I don't think. I mean, I don't think any of my patients have chrome dentures anymore. Um, maybe the odd one. But um, you know, I couldn't. I, c- I couldn't do that now on the NHS. Things move on. I know. But you know, that's another thing that you touch on there. Is just like um, we're going to be t- talking to technicians on the podcast as well. But it's just like de-skilling is one de-skilling, thing de-skilling yeah. and then the other things as well is that if you look at it from a technical point of view in the laboratories they will not wax up and calf crowns anymore everything's digital and you know digital obviously has its benefits but in, in one respect as well digital dentistry is is really elevated now and everybody wants to be a digital dentist mm. but it's kind of like it is kind of again de-skilling but it is in some respects, please don't get me wrong. I know you, you know, like you're talking about composite veneers. Don't mm. get me wrong; it always has its place. But we can't do everything digitally, mm. and we shouldn't be doing everything digitally. And it, again, it's, it's it's again it's sexy, and everybody wants to look at it and go towards it. But again, it's just um, when it doesn't work, what do you do? You know, you go back. and that and that causes anxiety with the with the kids as well. But um, you know, I've got to thank you for giving up your whole afternoon to come and talk to me today and you've been a wonderful guest and you've just uh, shared so much knowledge and your story as well honestly it's um it's 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 it, how can i describe it people don't talk about this sort of stuff and for you to be so open and honest about it you know it's uh 
is heartwarming a word? Yeah. It, <laughs> it warmed my heart. Oh, I'm but glad. you know, honestly, just what do you do in that situation where you know you you go into this? It's not like another degree where you have different things that you can do. Mm. You know, do a degree in finance. There's many, many different things you can go in. If you go into mm. dentistry, you're going to be a dentist. Yeah. So what do you do when you have that bombshell that you can't do this anymore or you won't be able to do it for as long as you anticipated? Yeah. So to listen to your story, you know, gives people... I hope so. Gives people something to, to, to um, you know, work with if anything I does hope happen. So. Because there's not... There will be other people. You know, there's one in 37 people with Parkinson's and that's a big number. That's a big And And percentage. it's going to increase, you know. The, it, it's it's a worldwide pandemic now. Parkinson's is increasing and it's, I mean, they think it's because of the Industrial Revolution and all the chemicals and things, but it is increasing. So there will be more dentists out there with this condition and they will be hiding it. They will not be telling people. And there is no need to be that person because the minute you stop hiding it, you suddenly feel a weight off your shoulders and you can actually still work. And if you've got a tremor or you're stiff, it doesn't matter because once you've taken medication, it goes away and you can still do dentistry. So don't delay diagnosis. Don't hide behind, you know, whatever you can find to hide behind. Mm. Address the problem. Go talk to someone. If you're worried, there's always people to talk to at Confidential. There's always people to talk about finances at the Benevolent Fund. There's always people to talk to at Parkinson's UK. Excuse me if it's a Parkinson's problem. Um, but it's something that you need to, as a any dentists, I want them that have health conditions, just don't hide it. Don't shove it under the carpet. It's not worth it in the long term to your health. It puts it down. So just get help. Go get a diagnosis and don't, don't make it worse by sitting on it. Right. I think the word I was looking for earlier was inspiration. Oh. You've been inspirational. That's very kind of no, you. No, thank absolutely. You. You've been inspirational, and uh, anybody listening to this or watching this will truly find it inspirational. So, thank you so much for giving up your time, and uh, great to see you again. Thank you for having me. It was lovely to see you too. It was really nice to see you. But no, thank you for having me. I hope it has been useful to someone, some people. I'm sure it will. Oh, absolutely, 100%.